Britain has the greatest number of unmarried teenage mothers in the world. That's what the teenagers want to have babies. I wanted a baby at young and I had one, so. There are 100,000 teenage pregnancies in the UK every year. When I lost my virginity, I was chuffed because I'd go around saying, I've lost mine of you last year. Our teenage pregnancy rate is twice as high as Germany's, four times as high as France. When I walk down the street, people look at you and say, they're little, they're little tarts, what have they got babies for? To me, there's nothing wrong with giving, having children when you're a lot younger. You've got to play your roles as mum and dad, you know, because he's here now and he relies heavily on you to take that role. He can't do anything for himself. How do you stop a girl or a boy from having sex with each other? Unless you're there 24 7, you can't be. Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday, dear Lizzie! Happy it's Lizzie McGauley's 15th birthday and she's eight months pregnant. One more. Look at that in my strike. Her sister Charlene is 16. She's six months pregnant. Their mother Julie is 34. And as well as her two older daughters, there's 14-year-old Vicky, Heather, who's 11, and five-year-old Julianne. And no swearing as well, Julianne. Jerry, their stepdad, also lives here. You, know, you have a pain in the bum. You are. You are. You don't sleep at night, you've got a bottle. Please, how old you are. That makes sense. Not to mention four dogs and two litters of puppies. She's making you old, the little Julianne. What? She's making you old. Yeah, you've got to. You're an auntie at five years old. You will be. You will. The family home is a three-bedroom end terrace on the Grange Park estate in Blackpool. When I first got pregnant, I thought about not having a baby. And I thought, oh no, I might as well keep it. Because I love it at the end. So I decided to keep it. The nice little baby. Well, I tried to have a baby at 14 because my little sister is five now and when my mum had her and that, I got it. I was like looking after her and it was just a, I was, it was just a baby around all the time and I think that's what drove me to have a baby because I wanted to look after her and I wanted to take the responsibility of having a baby. Both girls have steady boyfriends who are looking forward to fatherhood. Lizzie's boyfriend Don is 17, Charlene's boyfriend David is 22. When I told David, he just, I don't know, he was just over the moon, really. He was more excited than me. Same. Yeah. <laughs> Have you got any concerns, any worries, both of you, about how your life's going to change? Not really. I'm just loving it, minute by minute. I'm just excited. Can't wait. Yeah, I'm loving it now. It's not the best thing that's ever happened in my life. And we're both having boys. And it's now, it's just, just the way... Yeah. I'm so, I just think that's a girl. Yeah. When Lizzie was... Charlene's pregnancy was planned. Lizzie's wasn't. And she's been pregnant before, when she was 13. Uh, I had a suspicion because I didn't um, come on my periods for a month, so my mum took me to the doctor's and then we found out I was. But then I had a miscarriage. When I got pregnant the second time, it happened again. Um, I didn't come on my periods again for another month. So my mum took me back to the doctor's and said I was pregnant again. What did you think, Dom, when, when Lizzie got pregnant? Don't know. I just thought this is not right. 
That's it. <laughs> I was scared in a fin at first, but now I'm not bothered anymore. <laughs> Just think it's right now. I don't feel like it's a big deal for me to get pregnant because there is a lot of other girls that are younger than me that are getting pregnant. <laughs> There is a weary drudgery to Courtney Cassidy's daily routine that deadens the soul. She's just 18, but already it can be seen on her careworn face. She shows a resigned acceptance of a lot in life. Meet Courtney Cassidy, who's already enjoyed her 15 minutes of fame. Her story, three children with three different fathers by the age of 17. I never thought it was a big thing. I thought there was loads of people out there like me. I never thought it'd ever become like that, never. There are lots of girls in her situation, but not many as defiant as Courtney. I wouldn't go over and tell no one I'm sorry for anything, so I'm not the only teenage girl who's claiming benefits. Been on them for two years. Most women out there have been on them for life. Courtney was 14 when she decided she was ready to become a mother. I wanted a baby since I was younger, but I wanted a career first and then have babies, but then my sister had a baby and I wanted a baby of my own. Um, I met Lena's dad at school. Um, I started going out with him secretly. I used to meet him behind the ball court. And then I thought I fell in love with him. Um, we was always together, every day. He didn't know that I was planning to have a baby with him. Um, I told him I was on a pill, so he didn't know nothing about it. Courtney's plan worked, and soon she was expecting. Even when I was pregnant, I was denying it, weren't I? Because I asked Courtney. Months. You get a mother's instinct. I asked my daughter, are you pregnant? And it used to turn into arguments that she wasn't having sex and that. I asked to let me take her doctors and things like that, let me just see. Julie wasn't ready to be a grandmother. She'd been a teenage mum herself, with four children by four different fathers. You didn't want me to have Lena at that age, did you? No. No, I didn't. I asked, I, I asked her to abort. Lena Lee was born in May 2001. I was in labour with her for nine hours, ten minutes. And I had gas in her, and it was the best time in my life. It was wicked, I loved it. I thought, yes, I've got what I've wanted. And I was excited. But her 16-year-old boyfriend wasn't prepared for fatherhood. Well, we had an argument because I wanted to go and watch my friend get an award from school. He didn't want to watch Lena. Um, we had a bit of a scuffle. And I left that day. And we've never been together since. She was two weeks old when we split up. When Lena was born, I already predicted that she'd be left on her own with that baby. Because it does happen. A lot. And she was. A few weeks later, it was time for a night out with the girls. After I had Lena Lee, my mum looked after her one weekend when I went out with all my friends to celebrate birth Lena. Um, I was all partying and everything. I met some lad who was quite looking all right and that took him home. We did what we did. And obviously I fell pregnant with Lennon. Courtney now had two children under the age of two to care for. Hey, do you look nice? It was quite hard. At the time of having them both together, but you get into a routine 
of doing things yourself. I never thought I'd find another person who was roughly around my age to bring two babies up that weren't then. I never thought I'd be in another relationship. But two weeks after Lennon's birth, she met John. I seen this really nice boy outside McDonald's. I went over and spoke to him. He come back to mine. We slept together that night. And three months later, Courtney found she was pregnant again. It was the best birth I'd had. Most painful, but the best birth because I had him supporting me. He weren't just there to watch his baby being born. He was there for me. Leighton was John's first child, but he became father to all three. He's the best father anyone could ask for. Um, he's like a kid himself. He'll play with them, take them out, buy them sweets, do anything with them. But while we were filming, John and Courtney had a row, and he left home taking baby Leighton with him. You can't rely on any man. They're all the same in my eyes. All the ones I've had, they've all been the same, so... Apart from John, he was a bit different. Yeah, but you can never trust men. Don't bother me being on my own. I prefer it. A month later, John's back. Like every family, it's not perfect. We always have arguments. Everyone has arguments. There's no perfect relationship in the world. But at the end of the day, if we were in a race, then we'd probably win it because we're that strong. We have had ups and downs. It's been hard work with having three children and having a good relationship. We've both got to start growing up a little bit, you know, start get, like, getting our own house, getting a mortgage, car, you know, just normal things. I just start... Going on holiday. Yeah, bu building, building our lives up. I don't think my daughter's got a life at the moment. She's just existing. Yeah, it was my daughter's choice to... to go ahead and have three children. But I wanted a lot better for Courtney. And it's all right, people calling me for where was I when Courtney was getting pregnant all these times. I was there, but I couldn't be with her 24-7, and you can't stop your kids, no matter what, no matter what walk of life. It happens. I tried to be mum and dad. But you can't. I tried my best with them, and... We were spoiled. Ruined. I just tried to do my best. That's all I could do. If I could turn back time, I wouldn't have changed it. I know that they'd all have the same dad. That's it. I was said to still have all three babies. Do it all over again. And again and again. I still want babies, want one more. Soon. <laughs> Anita Carrington became one of Britain's youngest mums when she gave birth to her son Cameron five years ago. Anita was 12 years old, but her childhood had been troubled from the start. When I was four, my dad left and he sent me a few birthday presents after that, but my mum decided to get married and we moved and lost contact. I've got a picture of me sat on my mum's leg when I was about three, uh, but he's got his back turned to the camera and that's the only memory I've got is that picture. Anita met her first boyfriend when she was just 11. I met Cameron's dad when I was hanging around with some friends and he was just like chatting to me and things like that and went and asked me to go out with him and he was my first boyfriend. But at 12, she had never thought about having sex. It was just holding hands, there was no kissing, no cuddling, no anything like that. 
he was always on about, oh, I want to have sex, I want to do what everybody else does. His mum had a party and my mum and me went and I fell asleep on the sofa. And later that night, they had sex. After that night, I didn't even think that I could be pregnant. It didn't hit me in any way. I didn't really think of it like, oh, it could happen to you or just nothing could ever hit me. I had went into my head like that. But Anita was pregnant and she had no idea. I didn't feel any different, didn't look any different, apart from eating a weird source of food, which was really sort of crisp with loads of mayonnaise on top. This photo was taken a few weeks before the birth. Anita was 12 years old and eight months pregnant. The day before Cameron came, I was playing basketball and doing pee and doing normal things. I'd come home, had something to eat, I'd bath, went to bed. Woke up in the morning with stomach cramps. My mum said it was probably sickness and diarrhoea. So, went to the toilet got back in bed, cuddled up to my teddy, and woke up in a big wet patch. I laid back down. A couple of minutes later, I had to go back to the toilet. Started pushing and Cameron's head popped out. And Cameron was there in the toilet pan between my legs. He was six pound 13 when he was born. he come out with black hair with bits of blonde tint on the ends of his head, so it looked like he'd had his hair streaked. He was just really tiny and I didn't know what to do. It was just like a little baby doll and you'd just pick him up and cuddle him and feel so light and you'd be scared to drop him. So I never got off the bed with him, not for a long time. Cameron was a millennium baby, born in January 2000. It marked the end of Anita's childhood. The first few days, I just thought, this can't be real. Someone has pushed the clock forward in, for my life a bit too much. But it's a big, big shock and still is a big shock. Me and Cameron's dad lasted two, three years. He was more interested in other girls and weren't interested in me or Cameron, so I thought it's time to get out. People look at you and say, they're little, they're little tarts, what have they got babies for? At first it hurt me a lot, it really did. And I don't think I'm the best mum, but I think I'm a good mum. I think I'm coping well enough and, and everything he needs he will get eventually. Not straight away, but eventually. Is it the pride? Don't shoot me. Why? So don't... Don't you like the colour? But it's not the same as my That's the same colour as Man United. I'm afraid you're going to have to wear that one. Don't fit. Most important to me for Cameron growing up is that he will be able to stick up for himself. He will get a good education. He will have a good career and look after what is, what is important to him. And that's just what I want for him. <laughs> And now Anita's got a new boyfriend. I met Jordan on the 5th of December, which was his birthday. My cousin brought him round. And from there on, we've just been together and never really spent a day apart. And just love him. <laughs> He's there for Cameron. And now Cameron started calling Jordan daddy. Cameron's actually found someone he loves and who he can look up to. I don't change anything about my life. Cameron's just the best thing that's ever happened to me and I won't change him for a world, even if he's a pain in the butt. <laughs> School's out for Lizzie McGawley. She won't be coming back here until after her baby's born. It's due in a week's time. It's the last day today. She's really good, so I don't have to get up anymore. <laughs> So when I come back in September, I'll be a mum. It'll get boring now, because <laughs> there's nothing to do. 
Lizzie's sister Charlene left school earlier this year. She's now seven months pregnant, and for her, it's starting to drag. The pain. Yep. And the back pain, and trying to get up and trying to get clothes on. And socks, especially socks. I've got the worst stretch marks, and I've got the worst swollen ankles and feet. I've got them on my legs, and on my back, and on my boobs. So I've had the same here, but she's got them on the bottom of my legs as well. I got them on the bottom of my legs. I've got them on the top of my legs, and on my on my bum. And <laughs> <laughs> on my <laughs> bum. <laughs> Mum Julie and stepdad Jerry are trying to work out how everyone's going to fit into the house when both babies arrive. We just haven't got the room in this house. What's next? The front bedroom is where Charlene stays. This bedroom is where Lizzie is. The back bedroom, where the biggest room is, I've actually got three girls in there, which is Victoria, Heather and Julianne. And the floor, as you see, is where, where me are. and Jerry sleep. That's where we sleep. When, when baby comes along, the cot will go there. I'm worried and excited, and um, I hope it all goes well, but if it doesn't, then God knows what'll happen to me. I just hope nothing happens. When Charlene found out Lizzie was pregnant, Charlene started going in the humpy, cos she wanted to get pregnant too. Cos she's like, I'm older than you. Why can you get pregnant before me? I went, Charlene, it's not a game. It's it's not a race, who gets pregnant first? Well, I picked Bradley as a first name, but um, I had my heart set on that I was having a girl, but if I was having a boy, I'd call it Bradley, and, uh, Bradley Joseph Terrence Morgan. And, but Lizzie chose Bradley and that, and but it went into an argument. with double E at the end, not an EY. So why was she crying then? Has never really accepted you and has treated you rather as a kid. A baby is uh, kind of occupied me because I'm bored anyway in the house, doing nothing. Just sat around watching TV. But there's something to do, something to look after. It's not something that you could just have for the day and then you can say, right, well, yeah, I can have your baby back now. It's like, all right, you've got one for life. And before the real babies arrive, the girls are getting in some practice. Hi, I'm Hello. Jane from Life Choice. Hello. Lizzie and Charlene nice. are being given a virtual baby to look after to see how they'll cope. There we go. I've got a boy. Every time the baby cries, you have to say, Mummy's here. But of course, the baby can't hear you. Mm. So it's got to know that you're here. And that how it does that is. This is a, a wireless ID, so you've literally got to just pass it, which is going to be on your wrist, mm -hmm. over the baby's tummy. And the baby will know that you're there and will give you a little chime. Aww. So it's saying, oh, OK, Mummy's here, that's great. <laughs> so you've got to find out what the baby wants, and then you've got to give the baby what it needs. Mm. This is going to so, be fun. Just this is going to be so much fun. For the next two days and nights, Lizzie and Charlene are going to be in sole charge of their make-believe baby. Stressful bits was getting the, the pram in the car and getting it back out, so... Yeah, I had to lift it out. Yeah, and getting it down the stairs. bad because it woke up about four or five times in the night somebody would wake up David. So you yeah, it was in a big sleep. And then after that um, we had an argument which I knew that would happen. 
and then we started doing it together, like changing it and feeding it and winding it and that. And I'm really tired now and I've got a headache. Today. Well, I'm very well. How are you lot? All right. You're all right? Yeah. But, um, okay, shall we see how you did? Now, you've had an ID each. Right, so the control unit is going to give me the information about how well you've all taken care of the baby. And with this control unit, we can also determine what time, if there was any hassle, any problems, what time and what day it took place. So we can probably pinpoint who did what. So let's have a look. Yeah. <laughs> You've done brill brilliantly. Well done. The only small hassle, I don't want to take anything away from you, is that the baby has recorded a few unsupported heads. Mm. And it's enough for me to think, well, it's just getting used to holding the yeah. baby. When I was pregnant with Charlene, there was nothing like that around. So do you think that if you would have had a doll to play with when you were younger in that sense, do you think that would have stopped you getting pregnant I younger? Think, yes, yeah, I think it would have done, because I thought I ain't going for all that. But there's nothing like that, so... And there we are today. Charlene and it's Elizabeth. Four hours after the virtual baby goes back, Lizzie goes into labour. Father to be Don is steering well clear for now. We're bored, having a fag. Uh, been here since. Been here for about two hours, two hours and a half. Got here about six o'clock. I think you got here about six o'clock, weren't it? Yeah. And getting butterflies still. <laughs> I'm just waiting now. To see what they got to say. Hey, Parishion. How far? Yeah, centimetres, three yeah. centimetres dilated. Something. Maybe so, a long night. I know. Eleven hours on, and Liz is still in labour. <gasps> Charlene's been here the whole time. Lizzie, it's really sore, okay? <laughs> the only way you're going to get rid of that pain is to push this baby out and push that pain away, okay? <laughs> Surprise, most of the other ladies don't do this well. Not and some gas now and a bit of pethidine. Keep going, keep going. Long push down into your bottom, come on. Really push down. Keep going, keep going, keep going. <laughs> Brilliant. Still there, only if that contraction's still there, sweetheart. Big push, wonderful. A quick breath, Lizzie. Back down into your bottom again. Big push, good girl, that's it. Keep going, keep going, Lizzie. Come on, keep going. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Good girl, quick breath and a big push down into your bottom. Come on, keep going, that's it. Long push, Lizzie. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Come on, keep going. Come on. Come on, push. I know it stinks. Lizzie, Lizzie. Wait, it's over there, Ruth. Draw it up. Girl, I've only drawn it up. It's been a long night, and it's not over yet. <laughs> Push down into your bottom now. Just push right down into your bottom. 15-year-old Lizzie McGauley has been in labour for nearly 14 hours. Her sister Charlene, who's 16, is also pregnant and due to give birth in two months. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. And a pan. OK, little push, darling. Right. Right, now I want you to just stay there, not do anything. Lizzie and Charlene's boyfriends, David and Don, are staying out of the way. The next 
contraction, we'll push down into your bottom. Good girl, there you go, there's your baby. Okay. Oh, I see. It is a boy. Oh. <laughs> See him now. Bit nervous. Mm. Scary. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, just yeah, it's nice to light if you look proper. Mm. Hello. I don't really know what to think. So, it's made of blank. I'm not Oh, I see. Cute, isn't it? No, it's got blue eyes. What do you think? Gorgeous. Oh, yeah, lying on your face. Becoming a father to twins is a challenge for anyone, but coping with two newborns when you've only just become a teenager is hard to imagine. Well, it took me about a year to get used to the fact that I've got two kids, because I just thought it was my two nieces or something like that. But it took me about a year for it to dawn on me that, yeah, I've got two kids. James Sutton was just 13 when he became Britain's youngest father of twins five years ago. His girlfriend, Sarah, was 17. When we first met, I'd say James was about eight. I would have been about 11, 12. Um, when we first got together, though, because that was just as friends, when we first actually got together, he was about 11, 12. First time I seen him was when he come out of the, his top window in his house. And I just thought, I am going out of his brother, but he's a lot more better good looking. So I thought, I'm going to have a bit of that. I'm going to get rid of his brother and go for that. So me and Richard had an argument and I got rid of his brother and decided, right, that's it. So I told all my mates, I was like, I want I want him. So they dared me to go with him and I thought, this is it. So I went with him. And then a week later, we ended up going out. So I got what I wanted. My mates and all that were talking about sex, yeah, I've done this with this girl, I've done that with that girl. And um, I felt left out sort of thing, but I didn't really want to do it. But... Um, because I was too scared at the time and all. And um, my mates in school saying, well, I've done it, why haven't you done it? Everyone wanted to go out and do it. Someone wanted to be the first one. Her mates dared Sarah to sleep with me, and my mates dared me to sleep with Sarah. And just me and James ended up doing it first. Um, I was on the pill, but because of James's age, we didn't really think that I might... Well, I knew I could because I was on my periods, but I didn't really think James could produce any kids anyway. I thought and Sarah thought that I, that I, I couldn't fire proper, right? And uh, and then she found out that she got caught. And I thought, my mum's going to kill me, my dad's going to kill me. My family are just going to think I'm well too young. I'm not going to have a job and a career, which, which is what I wanted. And I just thought it'd ruin my life. I was, I was there playing on the computer 
and then she told me, and just said to her, I don't, you know what I mean? It's, you were, I can't believe you're pregnant. And she goes, but you've got to believe me because I am. I've been doctors and all that. But there was a bigger shock to come. We went to the, the scanning room with Sarah, and the woman who was scanning Sarah said to us, do you know you're having twins? And at the time, I was eating crisp before I got told. And I just stopped to eat, eat my crisp. And I was shocked because I was just expecting one. And I thought that it might have been really, 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 really hard to bring two up. James didn't really understand. I don't think he really knew what was really going on. I just got on with me, my life playing football and all that. Just didn't really en enter my mind until the kids were here. When Sarah went into labour, James carried on with his paper round, but he got there just in time. When the first one came out, I was all right about that, but then when the second one's come out, I was nerve-wracking, proper nerve-wracking I was. I think that really hit me when I seen him in the cubicles that they're actually my children. And I've got to feed them and look after him and clothe them and everything for him. By the time Sarah left hospital, the family was headline news. As we walked out the doors and was getting a lift home, there was reporters and people taking pictures and we didn't understand. But we just drove home anyway. On the way home, we got a phone call from Mum saying that don't come near the house because there's reporters everywhere. So I said to Mum, well, I don't understand what's going on. So she said, it's something about James is the youngest father in Britain, so I have twins. I didn't actually know I was the youngest father of twins until it came into the papers. And then that's when I found out I was. I think at the beginning, we just thought it'd be one Pa one story in one paper and that'd be it, but it didn't, it carried on. It was paper after paper after magazine, then it went to TV. People coming up to me, are you the one out of the paper? Are you uh, the, the youngest father of twins and all that? Sometimes I'll just say no, just to get rid of him. James was too young to work. He gave up school and stayed at home to look after Louise and Leah while Sarah got a job. It was stressful bringing the kids up. It is pretty weird living the life of a 25-year-old at the age of 13. I do miss going out with my mates, playing football or going, going to the pool table or something like that. Living the life of, like, a 25-year-old, doing, doing what a 25-year-old would do with two kids. I was worried about the fact that James was a lot younger and whether he could cope or not and whether he'd leave me because he did like hanging around with his mates and so did I, but I knew what my responsibilities were and I knew I was to bring a child up. But James had no ties and he could always go when he wanted. Five years on, they're still together and the girls are doing fine. I want the kids to have a better life than what I had. What it is is I don't want them to get pregnant like I did at very young. I want me and James hated school. I want them to like school. I want them to enjoy going. She put the bee inside her box the rabbit and the bird. Yeah. And she bumps her head. You have got to spend a lot of time with reading. They get books from school and homework, and we have to explain to them what to do, and we have to read through the books of them and try and get them to read them back to us. Green. Now, what is it? A love. That was a blue. Blue. Now, that's it. Now, you're going to go to sleep now. And James and Sarah are expecting their third baby. That's a lovely view there. See the head and the body and the heart beating away there. I've got one more on the way to make, make, make the family complete sort of thing, just free, that's it, no more after this. It's just, um, just me, Sarah, and Leah and Louise and, and the new one on the, on the way. I've passed on my GCSEs, which I said I would. Um, I've now gone on to university to do a degree to become a nurse and a midwife. Um, I've not gone on benefits. Only and Louise never want for anything. They can have everything they have. And with the girls at school, James has got a job too, so they share the childcare. At the end of the day, we've proved a lot of people wrong, and we are still together, me and James, and we have Bradley and Louise as well. Me and Sarah, um, well, we love each, each other to bits, and nothing's going to get in the way of that. And it is a strong relationship, and we are happy. Back 
Back in Blackpool, Lizzie's getting a visit from her midwife. How often is he up in the night? My mum watches him just downstairs. She said he's not up that much. That's, but yeah. the night shift is taking its toll on Lizzie's mum. Doing it, having the baby right early hours of the morning is so tiring, but especially when I've got other children at home as well and I have to be with my daughter and I've had it all. I'm, I'm doing it so far, but I think no, it's catching me now. Flicking. So you're not doing any night feeds? No, just in the day. And how that's going to happen Mother when... Mother Hen, she just likes to take over all the time. Who's Charlene? Yeah. I so... don't get to check. I've only changed him once since he's come from the hospital. She's been changing him. What about when <coughs> your baby comes? <coughs> are you then going to have your baby in the night and Charlene, your mum will have... Or what's going to happen then? What's going to happen then is Lizzie is going to be left to look after Bailey on her own without the help of her mum and sister. She needs to be taught how to cope with Bailey on her own. We're going to have your bottle now, are we? Yeah, are we? Good girl, you're only going to have a couple of ounces there. Maternity nanny Susie Whitehawk works for a London agency, helping new mothers to get their babies into good routines. A lot of my work is lawyers and bankers, and I've worked for some royalty as well. It, it can really vary. She's about to take on her first teenage mum. She's spending a week in Blackpool to help Lizzie with baby Bailey. People call me in very early on when they've had the, ba when they've had the baby, um, purely really to start the routine from day one, because it's quite important to establish that routine from the offset. Um, and as I say, it's, it's really important because it not only gives mum confidence as well, the baby's into a good routine, she knows what she's doing, and, you know, the baby's happy and contented, and they do thrive on that routine. And it doesn't take long to establish a new baby's routine. But there's more to motherhood than just that. Looking at the video, um, you're not telling me that Liz was the mum. I would think Charlene was the mum. Now, watching more of it, all I see is Charlene, mother and the baby, looking at it intensively, you know, really sort of, you know, longing me. And whereas Lizzie's looking like I'm, you know, fed up with it. And, and also not forgetting that she's still, she's still a child herself. <laughs> this is a family where there aren't many rules. But that is all about to change. I, when I go into a household, it, it's nice to have it calm um, and it's orderly because you've got to work in that routine. You know, baby can have a slight noise around, but not too much because it's really distractive for the child, you know, to, to actually get into a routine. Um, and you've just really got to have that calmness and organisation around you and just work with, with Mum. It's going to be a new experience for everyone. It is totally alien to me. I'll be quite honest, it is alien to me. There's no routine, there's no organisation, and this is where if I can help in that week to educate her, help her learn what to do, you know, there's a better way. And, that you know, at the end of the day, as I explain to all parents, you know, the baby is yours, you are the mum. That baby's not going anywhere else. You know, that baby's here to stay and you've got to deal with that. Fifteen-year-old Lizzie McGauley has been home with her baby Bailey for five weeks. But she's spent hardly any time with him on her own. Her mum and sister have taken over. But Charlene will soon have her own baby to look after. Maternity nanny Susie Whitehawk is spending a week with Lizzie, helping to get Bailey sleeping through the night. A routine has to be established in the house. Um, some organisation, because there doesn't seem to be any. Um, I mean, I'm going to observe and watch carefully and make my observations, and I think perhaps they do the same. I think, as my role, I think they're unsure of what my role is. Um, so that would be quite new to them today. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Hiya. Hello. <laughs> Hello.
Hello. Hello. Hey, hello. Hey. So how is he? How is he feeding and coping and he feels like he's mine. Yeah. Hey, uh, Lizzie and Don join the day with him. Mm. So everything's fine and Charlene does her little piece, don't you, Charlene? I look after him sometimes. Yeah. And what's he sleeping like of a night? <coughs> Not very good. Not very good. Well, normally what happens when you get him into a, a good routine during the day, the night time, really becomes really nice and peaceful, it really is. I mean, I can get them through the night at six weeks, it's not a problem if they're, they're feeding well and in a good routine during the day. Hey, but he's a bonny boy, aren't you? Today, Susie will just be observing Lizzie. Her changes to Bailey's routine will start tomorrow. What we do tomorrow, we get that prepared, how we're going to do the room tomorrow, put his pram up there. Um, when we fetch him up for quiet time, we bath him here, settle him down, take him into his room and then get him settled down. So when I bath him, if Don fetches the pram up, we get him ready. And then uh, I want to stick him into an eight o'clock yeah. routine. So if I start him at eight and then I'll do four hours, yeah. four hours and work him in. To get Bailey sleeping through the night, his new routine must be stuck to during the day. From now on, Lizzie and Don need to follow Susie's instructions closely, without any interference from the rest of the family. You know, we're going to try and be here by eight tomorrow, just to get the routine started. I'm going to try and work closely with Lizzie and Don and, and get them in yeah. and, and work with them and, and just, fun. you know, as the day goes. And the priorities are going to be is getting the baby into a routine. I'm going to work towards bathing, putting him down to sleep, setting his day routine as well, sleeping pattern, and things like that. So, okay, then well, it was lovely meeting you. I was spending some time with you, and um, <coughs> see you all tomorrow. Bye. 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 Her observation day over, Suze is confident she can get results. Realistically. I have a week and I, I, I feel that I can, I can achieve quite a bit in that week. So I think there's got to be a little bit of give and take and a bit of respect and to stand back and, and let Lizzie come forward as a mum. And, you know, I'd like to see how Lizzie performs this week with the, with the baby. It's the first day of the new routine. Susie's asked Lizzie and Don to be up and dressed for the eight o'clock feed, which is a lot earlier than they're used to. Everyone but Vicky is still asleep. <laughs> Twenty minutes later, Lizzie appears. It's all right, the door won't let me up. <laughs> How are you? Yeah. How was the night? Yeah, I woke up twice. Woke up twice? Yeah. Why did you want to sleep? You're right, you've got something to think. When was the last time you fed him? Uh, before six. Just before six. Okay, bless him. At the top of Susie's to do list is hygiene. I've washed up now, and what I've done is I've scrubbed this out and put boiling water on that, and I've rinsed the bottle from the solution that you've got for the sterilizer. Because that has to be thoroughly rinsed with boiled water and then drained out, and then the bottle's made. Um, I've boiled the kettle, I've let that stand now because you mustn't reboil it. And what I've done is now is I'm going to fill that with hot water and let it cool it down. And then I'm going to prepare the feed. But what I'm going to do in the course of the day is prepare the feeds, the bottles. Um, and that's why we need a section here to keep the bottles separate from anything else. So once they're made up, they can't be touched. But her advice is falling on deaf ears. So, uh, Don, I was just going to say, so how, how have you been normally doing them? Eight in the nine ounce bottle. Yeah, but mum's just put four in, in five water. I mean, five, four water. So you've five scoops into four water? Yeah. Yeah, that's over, that's over. It should be one, one scoop to one ounce. Yeah. So for every ounce, you put a scoop in. That's quite nice. Next, Susie takes Lizzie upstairs with Bailey. This is where he'll be spending a lot more time. If we can, try and keep him up here as much as you can just away from the dogs and, and the noise and that. And I think he needs that bit of quiet time where he comes up, has his sleep, and then comes back down, you know, and um, 
Because I think downstairs when you feed him, then Charlene takes him and Mum takes him and everyone. And I think I just found that you tend to go into the background when they do that. You yeah. tend to think, OK, then I'll let you do that and I won't do it. So it would be quite nice for you to bond with Bailey. I think it's quite nice you have that one-to-one -one with him up here. When I do you as day two draws to a close, Susie shows Lizzie how to keep track of Bailey's new feeding and sleeping routine. Into the rhythm of it. Once you've got into the rhythm of it, you don't need to use it. But it's going to be quite good for in the next, you know, few weeks to just keep it good on these times. When you settle him down tonight, uh, see how he settles down. If he's a bit unsettled, put down unsettled. If he's a bit windy, uh, 11 o'clock feed tonight. Write down you or Dom. Write down how much he's took, and if he settles down, okay. So it gives us an idea of how much he's taking, also how much water he's going to take as well. So you have you run into your routine, and it's good because he knows where he is. That's right. Right. So just give you an idea, Lizzie. From tonight, it's up to Lizzie and Don to keep Bailey in his new routine. Morning. Morning, heaven. Next day, Susie's back to see if Lizzie's been following her instructions. Older sister Charlene's up, but there's no sign of Lizzie. Lizzie. Nanny's here. <laughs> Lizzie says she'll be straight down. Bless his heart. <laughs> would you expect Lizzie to have been up? Yeah. Yeah, I would have. Um, I'm just um, waiting to see if he's been fed at eight, because I don't think he has. Yeah, I'll come in. Lizzie didn't understand Susie's instructions. When Bailey woke up at 3 a.m., she made him wait an hour for his bottle. Woke up an hour twice before his He woke up a, an hour before. It was, he woke up at 3. Yeah. Went to leave him to 4. Yeah. He fell asleep then. Really? Yeah. Because so, if he woke up at 3, you could, you could, yeah, you could have still fed him at 3. If you, if you want to. I only put four down because you said, you know, he wakes up at four. But if he wakes, it's just that if he woke up past... He woke up at seven, so it's eight. Ah, right, so, so you fed him at eight? Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Lizzie goes back up to her room to get ready. It's um, now 10 to 11. Um, I'm, I'm a bit uh, talked about they haven't come down. Um, I understand Don's very tired, but, you know, that's the sole point of fatherhood. And I think that has to be emphasised in today. And um, I will give them to 11 o'clock, and then I'm going upstairs to actually make a point of getting them down to, you know, start the day's routine. And I think it's important. I didn't intend to start it at 12 o'clock, so I'm going up at 11, and I'm going to, you know, fetch them down. This little chap's knees have got to come first, and he should be washed and changed well before this time. Bless him. When they don't come down, Susie goes up. Now he's an hour away from his lunch time, whereas normally in the morning, you know, he'd be up and dressed and ready by about ten, and like you and Lizzie might be out, taking him out and that. So he's I think. Usually dressed by now. Yeah, you know, even if you have a late night, sometimes you still got to keep him back on par with that routine in the morning. You know. Lizzie's not used to being told what to do, and she goes into a sulk. Are you all right, Lizzie? Yeah. You seem a bit quiet. You okay, is there anything you want to say to me or ask me or no? We don't know. You know, you are Bailey's mum, and um, this is why it's important today that you know you take an active role. Because you remember we were saying you were saying like everyone took over Bailey, and you wanted that bit of time with him, didn't you? And this is one way of you, you know, getting close with him and, and taking on that responsibility as mum. You've got to play your roles as mum and dad, you know, because he's here now and he relies heavily on you to take that role. He can't do anything for himself. And that's why it's important to keep to the times. You know, like today, we're sort of trying to get everything and he's, he's screaming for his feed, but he's got to be stuck to his times. The pep talk seems to work, and for the next few days, Lizzie and Don stick to the routine and start to enjoy caring for their son. Oh, brother new. He smiled at me in the kitchen. I got a tingly feeling in my nose. So I looked at him and he smiled. Do you want them? No. Mm. Mm. Spent a 
more, more hand in, more hand in, and just more relaxed as well. Before, they sat about all day because there was no one to show them what to do. They didn't know what to do. They just needed someone to encourage them, show them that there's, you know, that they have to do this. And I think it's built up their confidence. And it will, as time goes on, when they continue the program, which I hope they do, their confidence will be in leaps and bounds. It's Susie's last morning with Lizzie and Don. Well, it's day five now, and it's just after eight o'clock. And uh, they should be feeding baby by now, so they should be up and ready for me. So, young lady, are you still in bed? Yeah. Where's this eight o'clock I'm getting up and dealing with him? And Bailey's asleep too. According to the new routine, he should be up and dressed by now. I'm going to ask you to get up and uh, get yourself together, young lady. And then we'll sort Bailey out, OK? All right? I'll give you, I'll give you 10 minutes to sort yourself out. And then I'll come back up. Downstairs, Don tells Susie he's done the 3 and 6 a.m. feeds. Why did you do both feeds? Uh, Why wasn't it shared? Because I couldn't bother going back to sleep. So you took you took over the feed. Yeah. <clears throat> and Lizzie didn't get up at all. No, she was tired. So yeah. Was okay. I, I'm a bit disappointed. I thought she would have been up this morning mm -hmm. because I did say to her, you know, that the whole purpose of the routine is that once she's fed him in the morning, you know, that he's up and washed and dressed and, you know, yeah. get the day started, not not to get it started at lunchtime, because that's not the whole point of the routine. But, you know, she's also got to understand that she's Bailey's mum, and as, I know you're pretty good and you really are on Anne's dad, but she's got to take her responsibility as well. It's no good saying, all right, well, you, you have a sleep and I'll do both of the feeds. You've got to make her do it, Don, mm. you know? I know it's hard, but you have. You've got to make her do it. I'm going to give her another five minutes and I'm going up. I know you're tired, but you're still a mum and you've really got to take it in turns and, and get up. I mean, he's fast asleep now and it's just going to mess him up for the morning because by the time we get... I mean, we get him up now, it's 20 past eight, it should have been washed and changed and... Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going <clears> to... <throat> ask you to go and get ready and I'm going to put him on the bed and start him off, OK? All right, and I'll let you go and then we have a chat when you back again. <laughs> It's Susie's first time teaching teenagers the art of parenthood, and it's proved to be harder than she ever imagined. Hey, there you go, little chubby. They've done, they've done really well this week, they really have. But um, it's, it's not going to work if they don't get them up. It's been a tough week for everyone. It's a dear little song, but... <sighs> they've got no direction. And I think they've got no guidance, so... Even though I'm here this week... They've been doing well. My worry is that it'll slip out my cup. I hope it doesn't, because I hope what I've taught them this week is going to be really good. <clears throat> and they... I think they've done very well. And they've really sort of bonded with him, which is what I wanted them to do. <sighs> but I just feel they have... The, they have the help and support from Jules, but not the guidance in how to be parents. You know, someone to, you know, to whip them into shape, and I just feel they haven't got that when I go. And I just want to make it so better for him in the week that I'm here. I want to try and get everything I kept for him. <sighs> the rest of the day is spent trying to get back on track. Somebody's woken up. <laughs> He's woken up. Uh, 
I think what it is, Lizzie, everybody else was taking care of Bailey, weren't they, downstairs? Yeah. Whereas for the week we've been here, nobody's really had that chance because we've, we've took that away and took him upstairs, haven't we? Which really means that you and Don have been on hands with him all the time, which is good. You know, and the way you bonded with him is really good. Um, what can you see? I know I need to get up. <laughs> you know you need to yeah. get up. Yeah. Because he needs to come before me, so... It's finally sunk in. Lizzie is Bailey's mum and she has to put him first. In three weeks, Susie will be back to see how they're getting on. Three weeks ago, maternity nanny Susie Whitehawk helped teenage mum Lizzie McGauley and boyfriend Don to get their son Bailey into a routine and sleeping through the night. Today, she's back in Blackpool to see how they've been getting on. I'm quite excited to go back. I'm really looking forward to going back to see Don and Lizzie again. Um, I hope they've kept up the routine. And there's quite a lot that I've talked to them over that week that I was there. So I'm expecting a few little hiccups, you know, perhaps they haven't kept to everything. But if they kept to a majority of what I've taught them, then I should be very pleased. Yeah. But by now, he should be sleeping through the night. Yeah, so how's it all been going? All right. Yeah. You've been finding it easy to keep to the routine? Yeah, it's, it's oh. easy. <laughs> That's a good chat. That's a good chat. It's easier. Yeah. So you found it okay in, in, in yourself to stick to that yeah. now. You're finding it very good. It's good. And you've seen the benefit of Bailey benefiting from that as well. Yeah. yeah. And now Bailey's sleeping through the night. Everyone's happier. No, that's really good. I'm really pleased. Yeah. yeah I was going to ask you, Jules. Do you find do you find it's helped having that routine? with uh, Lizzie and Don working with the baby, having that routine and everything? Yeah, it has. What you've taught him, everything's gone fine, I think it has. Anyway, I mean, he's gone into the routine of, like, everybody has his bath, goes to bed. Yeah, Lizzie spends a lot more time with that child now, doesn't she? Yeah. yeah. Spends a lot more time with baby. And as part of Bailey's new routine, he's getting a daily dose of sea air. Well, at yeah. first it was quite hard with you telling us what to do, doing with Bailey, washing him. Did you resent that at first when I first came in? Um, at first I didn't, but afterwards I started to get used to it. Yeah. But after when you left, it started to get easier. Yeah. What you're showing us and what to do with the bottles and bathing him, bed and feeding And as him. you both said, it, 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 the tasks were a lot easier yeah. once you got into that routine, wasn't it? Yeah. Now, well, I think you and Don have done really well. I mean, what, what you had to cope with that first week was quite a lot to take in, and you'll learn more as time goes on. What do you feel the f future holds now for you? For you and Don and baby? I, I want to go to college and do childcare. Mm -hmm. And just get a good, good job, or get him into school. And with Lizzie looking after Bailey, Don's found a job. We've come closer since Bailey's been born. Hopefully, me and Don stay together for mm -hmm. Bailey's sake. Yeah. Um, I feel he supports you quite a bit, which is nice, nice to see, because you're both so young. And it's nice to see him, you know, really taking responsibility on and working with you and supporting you, so... But, um, no, I'm really, really pleased, really am. With Susie's help, Liz is getting the hang of motherhood. But for her 16-year-old sister, Charlene, the journey is just about to begin. It's 6am and she's in the last stages of labour. Her boyfriend David hasn't left her side. Go on, keep going. Well done, Charlie. Okay, what's in there? Go on. Go on, keep going. Fantastic. Go Good on. Girl. Go on, Charlene. Keep it going. Go on. 
Kom yes, aan, kom aan. Kom aan. Kom aan. A week later, and both sisters are home with their babies. Put it up a bit, because they'll get wind. Sometimes he proper gulps it down, and he's like... <laughs> and he can't breathe. It is weird that me and Shelley's had a baby. But with being sisters, if she needs advice, she just ask me. Or if you need or, it. Or if I need it, I'll ask Charlene. Oh, She's bringing her baby into the world. It's a big thing, though, isn't it? It's the best thing, really. <laughs> well, I love him with all my heart. He's priceless. I love him, Bradley. He's the best thing to me that's ever happened. Mm. I don't care what people think when I walk down the street. Neither do I. You know they're staring at you because the way yeah. they look at you is, you know, that she's got you. Yeah. And it's like when you was pregnant, when we was pregnant, that people look at you like you're a disease or something. Yeah. Like, oh, she's got something. But we don't, we don't care because we've brung some... We've brung our own flesh and blood, our son, into life, into the world. So we're not really bothered what other people them. say. We're, we're lucky because some girls out there can't have babies. The clouds evaporate the uh, water. Look, see, look at the colour of it. I'd die for him, mate. <laughs> if someone said to me, it's have you or your baby, I'd die for him. I'd say, yeah, I'd die yeah, for him. Yeah, because you've lived your life, haven't you? Well, you've not lived your life 15 years, like, but you've lived some of it, so... But your baby hasn't. I feel like I'm older, though. I don't feel like I'm 15. Mm. I feel like I'm an older mum, not a young mum. You don't really care about your babies, do you? No. Just, you, you have to act mature when you've had a baby. You can't go around acting like a kid anymore. No, you've got to take the responsibility. 